Hey there, it's Kyle Boone, aka Strong Jaw, staff writer at CBS Sports. Welcome to the Ion College Basketball Podcast YouTube channel. We've got a special episode for you today. Nathan Grubel, content manager for one of the best kept secret spots for draft coverage on the internet, No Ceilings, is here. And we're going to talk through uh, a bunch of stuff that's happened in, here in the last week or so. Uh, since we last talked, the draft lottery has happened. The NBA Draft Combine has already wrapped up from, from Chicago. And so we're going to get into kind of some, some takeaways from that. And we're going to do, as the people love, a mock draft. We're going to do a, a lottery mock alternating between each other, 1 through 14 picks. Uh, so now that the, the lottery balls have spoken, uh, the Orlando Magic, for the first time since selecting Dwight Howard in 2004, will be picking number one in next month's draft. So Nathan's here to sort out exactly what that means for the Magic, uh, for the draft, and we're going to talk through the rest of the, the lottery order as well. Talking winners and losers, and we'll run through a quick uh, mock, just generally give our, our first impressions of what lottery night and combine week meant. Uh, before we dive in, though, Nathan Grubel, let's bring him in. How are we doing? Thanks for thanks for coming on the show. Uh, let's get right to it. Let's uh, let's bring you right in. Your takeaway from from Combine Week was I know I know you were able to kind of follow a little bit from afar. Any anything that stood out to you from from Combine Week last week? So I could probably pick out a few winners and losers, Kyle. Um, yeah. the, the biggest thing that stood out to me from a measurements perspective was the Mark Williams stuff. Like yeah. I personally did not think that he was seven foot two. You throw in his wingspan, the standing reach. I mean, he is going to be a physical presence in the NBA from day one. And I, I think he really helped himself on that front with a lot of the interview stuff he did as well. Um, great video piece by Mike Schmitz um, up on ESPN's YouTube right now. Good interview with him. So he really helped himself. And then Jalen Williams, the other real big combine winner in my eyes. We had no ceilings. First of all, I'm glad that you shouted us out as the best kept secret um, in, in the draft world. I, I love that. But we've we've been on him. If you follow no ceilings, yep. our own Tyler Rucker has been on him for a while. And he really helped himself, not just in a lot of the combine stuff, but also really the games. Came out, was one of the guys who actually played, who wanted to compete in the games. That's obviously a big thing that can help. But then his performance in those games as well really showed off a lot of his two-way versatility, has some three-way scoring potential, plays out of the pick and roll. I love what he brings to the table. He's been a riser into the first round over the last like month, month and a half. Now you're starting to hear his name in like top 20 circles after the combine week. So those are really my two big winners um, to take away from the combine. You copycat. That's exactly the two names that I had written down. Jalen Williams from Santa Clara, who played several years in college and was kind of, kind of flying under the radar a little bit. Uh, there was some some smarter, sharper uh, people who were on him over the last like six weeks to two months. It wasn't me. I will not take credit for it. It was it was Tyler Rucker from from our company and those ceilings. I won't take credit for it, but he yep. he got us all on the ship pretty quick. Yeah, a six foot six wing who's who's got an incredibly long wingspan, a really good three point shooter, and kind of stood out from from the combine in terms of the scrimmages, just because he was one of the few potential first rounders who was actually competing in the scrimmages. Um, I thought that was really impressive. And then Mark Williams, obviously, with with uh, you measuring seven foot two in shoes, seven foot seven wingspan. I know Nada is uh, is keeping a close eye on Mark Williams with the Hornets potentially looking to add a big man in this draft. Uh, so I'm really interested to see if he does go in our, on our, in our lottery mock that we're about to dive into. And if so, where he ends up going, but let's just get right into it. I'm going to give you the first pick in this mock draft. You're going to be picking for the Orlando magic. And then we're just going to alternate pick by pick. Uh, I've been really nervous. I have to admit, I feel like you're a sharp, you're in on this. I'm hoping my guy falls to me at number two. Uh, I don't want to give away too many hints, but you're on the clock for the Orlando magic at number one. Who are you going to take? I'm going to take Jabari Smith, um, out of Auburn. I'm not, not, not gonna, not gonna throw any curveballs on this podcast, Kyle. I mean, all, all the Intel that I have, all the Intel, I just actually put out a podcast on my draft deeper feed with Matt Babcock, all the Intel that he has as well. 
you're hearing that Jabari Smith is the likely name for Orlando, and, and for good reason. His two-way versatility, his shot making. It, Orlando just needs offense, right? They just need guys who can put the ball in the basket. And from the perimeter, we know Jabari Smith is arguably the best shooter in this draft class up there with AJ Griffin. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take him at number one. We're not gonna not gonna throw any curveballs for the first pick. This pleases me immensely. I am picking number two for the Oklahoma City Thunder, my hometown team. And look, I'm going Chet Holmgren. I'm going to keep kind of the chalk rolling here. Uh, seven footer from Gonzaga, just an elite defensive prospect. I, I've talked to some people um, just around the state this past week who have been very, very nervous about Chet Holmgren, but I, I think you just gotta gotta roll the dice. Like you could go Palo Bancaro here and maybe take a, a safer prospect, but Holmgren's defense is absolutely elite. Uh, the the physical frame is the only I think real question about how he's gonna hold up. But he held up fine in college. Uh, he's he's one of the most competitive players in this draft. A guy who's gonna you know obviously be able to defend multiple positions. He can he can switch out onto the perimeter. Like the versatility that he brings on defense, what he's going to do on offense as just a floor raiser, I think is is really impressive. And OKC, I think it is, is in a position now where they want to take the biggest swing in this draft. I'm yep. super high on Jaden Ivey, but I believe that Chet Holmgren is, is the biggest swing in this draft. And, and, and I think just the last point to add to, to your audience about Chet, too, is that he he did not show everything that he's capable of in the offensive yeah. end at Gonzaga. Like he was he was basically a play finisher, whether it was just really easy stuff around the basket or like the trailer threes. He can do more than that from a creation standpoint. Very underrated passer. I think he can really check a lot of boxes for Oklahoma City. And you see that Presti kind of wants to draft these guys who are they're, they're connectors in the sense of they want to just keep the ball moving in Oklahoma City. Yeah. Right. And Chet. He, he's not going to be one of these guys to hold on to the ball to really be a uh, stick in the mud in the offense. He's going to keep the ball moving and make the right decision. So he'd be a great fit in Oklahoma City. Yep, absolutely agree with that. You are on the clock at number three. You're picking for the Houston Rockets. And Nathan Grubel, you are taking – drumroll, please. Not going to make any any of the Houston Rockets fans mad. We're going to take Paolo Bencaro. Um, I think a lot of that fan base wants Paolo – there and for good reason i mean you you look at what they have with Jalen green he could potentially be a number one scoring option for a really good nba team in the future now you throw in paolo bencaro who at times has looked like a potential number one option definitely going to be at least a number two or a number three option you're just taking care of the offensive warts with that team right another guy who is a very underrated passer arguably one of the better passers in this lottery he's going to be able to keep the ball moving in houston and kind of feed everybody else on the offensive end, the, the, the two, the, the two man game with him and Jalen green, plus the high low stuff with Alper and Shangun. Come on. How can you not root for Powell to go to Houston? So I'm going to take him in number three. Yeah, I love it. I feel like Jaden Ivy could be in play here, but the fit yep. in Houston, especially after drafting Jalen green last year, I think it's, it's questionable at best. Uh, you take the guy who I think fits kind of the roster. And if it's a tiebreaker between Ben, ben Caro and Ivy, you just maybe take the guy who has, you know, maybe the best fit. The, the, me, the NBA sits at the intersection of size, skill, and IQ, right? And Paolo, That's exactly right. All, all these top three guys that were taken, at the end of the day, I, just, I don't see anybody else breaking into that top three. I really don't. Yep, and I agree with you. So at number four for the Sacramento Kings, I'm just going to take Jaden Ivey. Uh, I think this is yep. where the draft may turn on its head. Uh, do they go, you know, maybe a high upside swing here with maybe Aiden, uh, Shaden Sharp or A.J. Griffin? Two guys who I think could be in, in play anywhere from like four to 10 in this yep. draft. I think that is a legitimate question. And I'm curious to see which direction the Kings go. Uh, but with Jaden Ivey, I think look, you, you've got a guy who has superstar potential. Um, that feels potentially a need depending on what the Kings are going to do with, with De'Aaron Fox. And after drafting Davion Mitchell last year so, uh, I like his, his superstar potential. He's obviously one of the most explosive athletes in this draft class. And to me, I think this is more just that you draft the best player available on the board here. That is Jaden Ivey. But Shaden Sharp, to me, I think is is maybe the sleeper here because he didn't play at Kentucky last season, obviously. Six foot six wing, but the former number one overall recruit in his respective recruiting class. Yep. Um, if, if you're thinking long term in terms of just like pos biggest possible swings, uh, Sh Shaden Sharp to me, I think is absolutely in play. So I'm curious to see, I'm kind of hoping that he slides here, but curious to see how, how far he slides in, in this, in this lottery mock here. I mean, I, I have Detroit Pistons next, so I'll just say I will take Shane Sharp 
for the Pistons at five, but it, it, it's a conversation between him and, yeah. and Jay and Ivy. I think with what the Kings would want to keep building towards, um, you want to take the more sure player and what Jay and Ivy was able to do in the big 10 in a power conference. I mean, we, we haven't seen Shane Sharp um, play, play in a big conference. He didn't play college basketball. I will admit I was the guy who took on the challenge to, to write the Shane Sharp profile for no ceilings. And I've told everybody, it was one of the hardest things I've had to write in a while because we just don't have a lot of film to, to go, go off of when we're doing that evaluation. Um, but you look at what he does have six, six, the length, the tools, the shot making ability from deep. There are a lot of comparisons you can throw out there to what Jalen Green showed last year. So I think at number five, you want to take that type of shot maker with the potential star upside the pair with Kate Cunningham in the backcourt. Take a little bit of the offensive pressure off him. Roll the dice. I mean, you could throw other names in play at, at that number five pick, but honestly, I think they would just go with the upside at that point and take sharp. Yeah, I like that a lot. I, I feel like Keegan Murray is maybe an interesting one that could be in play here as well. But I put that out on Twitter and I got a little roasted a little bit. Everyone's like, you should really target him at five. I'm like, listen, man, I, I put out the case for Keegan at, at number five. I think he should really be considered like the five, yeah. six, seven range. Yeah, absolutely. The, the K Keegan pick and roll would be would be pretty filthy in terms of just offensive potential would be really good. Keegan's Keegan's a fantastic versatile defender. Um, and th- it's more, I think this is more of like a ceiling versus floor type of play. Um, if, if you're Detroit, like Shaden Sharp is obviously like has superstar potential. If you can get a superstar next to, to K Cunningham uh, from this spot, that's fantastic. I don't think yep. Keegan Murray is going to be a superstar, but I'm very confident he's going to be a really good NBA <laughs> player. So exactly. Um, I think he's absolutely in play here. I'm glad that you picked Shaden Sharp. I'm curious now where where uh, Keegan Murray is going to fall because at number six for the for the uh, for the Pacers, I'm thinking AJ Griffin, um, Duke Duke guard who started last season injured, uh, looked like I think at times a potential top three talent in this draft class. Shot better than forty percent from three. He's going to be an immediate shooter in the NBA. Defensively, I I think he's he's got a really high floor long term and. Uh, just in terms of his body, I think he's going to be able to contribute right away. Uh, to me, I think he has all-star potential. And at number six, I think you're running out of potential all-stars in the future. So A.J. Griffin, to me, is a pick at number six. That's a great point. You want to be star hunting for as long yeah. as you can be in the lottery. And there are major defensive concerns with A.J. Griffin. There are yep. some athletic concerns in terms of what he might have lost since some of the injuries from his high school days, but when you just look at the offensive upside, you, you, uh, this has been said multiple times, but it is true. You're not going to find many 18 year olds in college basketball with better freshman shooting seasons than what AJ Griffin just had. And you throw in some of the stuff he can do off the bounce, the mid range shot making at on his best days offensively, he looks like a Jimmy Butler clone. So you really yep. have to take that into account. So I, I don't hold that against you one bit. Yep. Yep, I'm ha- I'm happy with it. So at number seven for the Trailblazers, you are on the clock here. Come on, you really am going to let Keegan Murray slide anymore? <laughs> I mean, th- this this is this would be a great spot for Keegan because obviously, if Portland does keep the pick, we 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 know the pick's going to be in play. We we don't know if mm-hmm. they're going to trade it or if they make a selection, but if they do, and Keegan fell, they'd be really happy to get somebody here who. The reason why I wanted to say that he'd be in play for Detroit at five is you just watch the playoffs and you watch what's important in the playoffs. And again, that intersection of size, skill, and IQ, Keegan checks all of those boxes. And he was one of the more impressive players I got to see in person in college basketball this year. Just what he can do offensively from a shot-making standpoint when plays aren't called for him, how efficient he can be. And then defensively, I saw him against Rutgers um, and – He missed, I think, one rotation on defense the entire game. Just I can imagine him playing heavy playoff minutes in his first two years in the NBA. And I think what Portland wants to do is get back into the playoffs with Damian Lillard. So I can't think of a better option at number seven. Yeah, no, I I think this is probably about the range where he's going to go. If he ends up slipping to number seven, I can't imagine Portland passing on him. Uh, At number eight for the New Orleans Pelicans, I'm very excited to pick here, by the way. New Orleans is the only NBA team that can lay claim to securing a lottery pick in this year's draft after securing a spot in this year's playoffs. So they're in a position where, you know, Zion Williamson comes back next year. 
they add a lottery pick to the roster and suddenly, you know, they're, they're not only potentially pushing for a playoff spot, but maybe like seriously contending in the West. Like this is a really interesting spot. Uh, I'm going to take Ty Ty Washington from Kentucky. I feel like this may be a little high compared to consensus, but I have been very high on Ty Ty Washington throughout this draft process. He played, he played hurt throughout most of the end of the season for Kentucky. I think we saw uh, potentially some of his, his ceiling uh, at Kentucky, but also some of his floor. Uh, he played off the ball at Kentucky, which was not totally expected. Severe Wheeler was kind of the, the combo lead guard for Kentucky. But when he had the reins, when Ty Ty Washington had the reins, what did he do? He broke John Wall's assist record in a game. So – I feel like the passing, the playmaking, the vision is all there. He could be a potential lead guard. And either way, like if he's not like a starting point guard in the NBA, his shooting and his shot making versatility, I think is going to be an immediate upgrade for the Pelicans. Maybe as like a off the bench shot shooter for, for the Pelicans. So uh, I feel like this is kind of a really good kind of fits in need, but also could potentially be a starter for, for a playoff team down the road. So Ty Ty Washington, I know based off of your reaction, this may be a little bit high, but I'm willing to take the play here just knowing that his his playmaking and his shooting is is going to translate to the NBA. So it's it's a little rich for my taste. However, one of the most interesting things that Matt Babcock did say on my show, all the buzz from the combine, is that Ty Ty's not making it out of the lottery. And I was like, that doesn't match up with where I might have him on my board. But if we're if we're going off of that thinking right you look at where he could fit the new orleans fit does make sense if you buy into the defense because offensively a lot of those things that people have concerns about as far as him being a true lead guard those are things he doesn't have to worry about in new orleans there are so many other guys are going to be handling the ball really he can have a role whether it's starting next to a cj mccollum or coming off the bench you can just worry about doing what he does best on offense which is being a three-level shot maker so i i do like the fit if we're operating that he's definitely going to be in the lottery Yep, absolutely. All right, you are on the clock at number nine for the San Antonio Spurs. So I'm going to take Dyson Daniels here. And Dyson Daniels yeah. is a guy, again, going off of more intel. He is really not going to fall out of the top ten, and you start to look at where he could have went, could have been in play for Portland, could have been in play for New Orleans. I think San Antonio would love to bring him in sort of as a guy who can connect some of the pieces together on offense. And then he is, without a doubt in my mind, the best perimeter defender in this draft class. So Dyson Daniels would definitely be a prime target for them with some upside. A lot of people are throwing some crazy comparison names out there a little bit, but really pointing to this, the, the star ceiling that he could have given his age and what he was able to show, especially second half of the year for a night. So I'm going to go with him. No. So with Dyson Daniels, I agree. I think he's, a, he's definitely a lorry pick. What do you see his role on offense being in the NBA? Because like, I don't necessarily see him. I'm not scouting him as like a lead guard defensively. He's going to be awesome. Like no questions about that, but what is his role in the NBA in terms of offense and just like maybe some comparisons from, from what you've seen scouting him. I mean, the the biggest comparison to me that stands out is Tyrese Halliburton. I think you can yeah. see a lot of the same stuff that Tyrese Halliburton has been able to do with the Kings and now the Pacers you see Daniels come in and do within his first two years in the league. And that was the impression that I got really more of maybe not your most traditional lead guard, but a secondary playmaker. Somebody always keeps his head up, gets everybody else involved in the offense. Then when he comes off that screen, it's very hard to keep somebody who's six, seven, six, eight out of the lane, um, keep them from getting to the basket. Then you throw in some of the shot making he can bring for the mid range um, and his improved three point stroke. He just checks a lot of boxes on both ends of the floor. Yeah. I like that. Um, I'm I'm going to go I feel like there's not a lot of players who have the immediate translatable skill of being sharpshooter in the NBA. Ochai is obviously a senior. He's a little older in terms of draft prospects, but we saw him with Kansas this past season being the alpha on a championship winning team. Shot making is going to translate. He's a great three point shooter. Don't think he's a star necessarily, but I think he's a guy who's going to be an NBA starter uh, long term. Great frame physically, a guy who can really get up in you on defense. Just a guy who checks a lot of boxes. A very good, safe 
NBA prospect. And in the lottery, I feel like, for, especially for the Wizards, you don't really want to miss, especially if you have a lottery pick. This feels like a safe pick. And uh, and I'm fine taking him. You know, this again, this may be a little bit rich at, at number 10, but I'm fine taking him here at number 10. I would agree with you. I think the Washington Wizards is just going to look for complimentary pieces. They still want to build around Brad Beal. Brad Beal still wants to be there in Washington, so they're just going to look for some of the best fits around him. And Bradley Beal, whether they bring in another point guard, quote-unquote, or not, he's still going to have the ball in his hands, and he's going to have to drive, kick, find guys to make open shots around him. So Ochai Abaji, we know he can do that, and we know he can defend his position. So he'd be a good fit at 10. Yep, absolutely. All right, New York Knicks, you're on the clock at number 11. Oh, man, giving me a lot of pressure with the New York Knicks. I'm surprised this guy's fallen a little bit, Kyle. I'm going to take Benedict Matherin for the Knicks at 11. Oh, um, yeah. Big, big wing, somebody who – he may not have as much upside as a shot creator as some people would care to admit, but we know what he's going to do. He's going to be a lob threat cutting baseline. He's going to be a really good catch and shoot guy, awesome transition finisher. And then defensively, he's not the most perfect defender we can point to in this draft class, but man, does he really bring it. He really cares. He tries, he hustles for loose balls. That's the type of guy that we know Tom Thibodeau, if he's still the coach in New York, he would love to be able to play. Um, give minutes to in his rookie year. And then you look at his upside. He can become more of that shot creator at the wing, six, seven, six, eight. So I think New York Knicks fans, I, I, in general, I think the Knicks front office would run up to the podium if, if Matherin was still on the board at 11. So I'm going to take him. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of running the podium, uh, that, that sound you hear. Yeah. That's, that's Sam Presti sprinting to Adam <laughs> Silver to turn in the pick. Uh, for Oklahoma City at number 12, they're picking Jeremy Sohan from Baylor. Cannot believe he fell to number 12. Super pumped about this. Uh, combo forward from Baylor, a guy who a year ago was not on the one and done radar at all. Had a really strong finish to the freshman season he had last year for Baylor. Um, a guy who's super versatile on defense, uh, a really good playmaker, a guy who – at times, Baylor ran its offense through Jeremy Sohan. Uh, just a guy who I feel like is always in the mix, a guy who's always making plays and wreaking havoc. Uh, I, I feel like this is a really, really good fit. Obviously, he needs to address some depth in front court. Uh, Sohan can do that. I, I feel like he can slide and basically play like three, four, and five in it, on an NBA team. And – OKC loves its versatility. They love guys who are who are really athletic defensively. I think he can guard multiple positions. So very thrilled for me that he fell to number 12 for the Oklahoma City Thunder. So I get to add Chet Holmgren and Jeremy Sohan to my roster. Pretty, pretty pleased with that. I would agree with you on a lot of fronts. I think there are some concerns on the offensive side of the ball from a shot making standpoint, but everything you pointed out about the defense, you know that he's going to be able to check a lot of boxes on that end. Zero hesitation from you to make that pick. We're, we're considering one of the two bigs possibly no, no Jalen Duran or Mark Williams love in that spot. I was not. In fact, I'll tip my hand here. I was considering Ushman Dieng from uh, at number 12 for this pick, but I'm kind of hoping that he slips uh, to my next pick. So uh, you're on the clock, I guess, at 13. I'm guessing one of the bigs is going to come off the board here. They they are, and man, yeah. I've gone I've gone back and forth between both Duran and Mark Williams. I'm going to take Duran, knowing that he has ultimately yeah. more upside with a team that, while I think Charlotte's probably under the gun a little more than people would care to admit to to win more basketball games because they have the star that Lamelo Ball is. At the same time, Duran does technically fit the timeline to be able to grow with the team. And if you if you get him to be the player that he can be, he could be like a Bam out of bio type of big on the court. And that's far too enticing to pass up at 13. So I am going to take him. Yeah. I just talked to the game about Usman Jang. And at number 14 for the Cleveland Cavaliers, I'm taking Johnny Davis, Wisconsin star, three-level scorer, a uh, guy who I think is going to translate immediately to the NBA uh, had a really good sophomore season with the Badgers this past season. Definitely, I mean, just an absolute dog. He's a monster. Um, and, and I think the offense is going to translate. I, I wish that his, his three-point shooting 
numbers were like a little bit close for percent um but he was like clearly the number one on every team scouting report i feel like his three point being it's in a less role a complimentary role kind of a type of guy uh it, those shooting numbers are going to i think tick up a little bit um and so this is a guy i think you know three and d i think maybe possibly underselling what he can be in the nba but like a premium three and d player who you know, for a cavaliers team that is contending right now in in the borderline you know playoff i feel like he's gonna be an immediate guy who who is going to help that team so jo- johnny's probably who i would have taken at eight if i had your pelicans pick i yeah. think that would have been a good fit for him he can be a fit all the way from from yeah. seven and eight down to to 14 um, yeah, excellent pick by you. I think the other name that I'd put in play for the Cavs would be Malachi Branham out of Ohio State. He's another guy who's yeah. really risen up draft boards. I'm a big, big fan of his. I've heard nothing but good things about him from those who are at the combine as well. So, yeah, I love it. All right, that concludes our lottery mock draft. Folks, if you enjoyed this podcast, we'll be doing similar draft content on Nathan's podcast. So Nathan, be sure to tell where 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 you find podcasts. Visit um, Spotify and iTunes. So you can find my podcast, the Draft Deeper Podcast, wherever you get your podcast: Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. You can also find my written work as well as the written work of others um, on the No Ceiling Substack, No Ceilings Make sure to go check that out. One of our writers, Nick Johnson, put out a beautiful piece this morning about why he actually wants to, to write and, and cover the draft for a living. May, maybe tear up a little bit, so hopefully it can inspire some others to choose this line of work similar to how you and I have, Kyle. So definitely make sure all of your listeners go and check out that piece. And all the other draft content we have, we're pumping out content Monday through Friday on the Substack. And we got three podcasts pumping out episodes, usually about five to six episodes a week between all our podcast feeds. So make sure you tune in and everything we're doing and no ceilings and Thank you so much, Kyle, for having me on. Truly, this this opportunity means a lot to, to me personally and everybody in No Ceilings. Absolutely. Be sure you're following the No Ceilings team over the next month. They are truly locked into the draft scene. They're absolutely obsessed with it, and that absolutely flows through in their draft coverage. So I've really enjoyed following Nathan and his team. And as teased, my latest mock draft, post-lottery, post-combine, uh, will be up later this week. If you want to check out my last update from after the lottery, uh, that is already up on cbsports.com. Go check that out. If you're not already subscribed to the YouTube channel, what are you doing? Go subscribe to the YouTube channel, Eye on College Basketball Podcast YouTube. Be sure you're subscribed to the podcast as well. Um, Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish are doing draft episode capsules. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, leading up to the NBA draft next month, a lot of draft content coming at you over the next month. Nathan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for your time. And uh, we will catch you guys next time.